and I, I think that part of the job of the artistic community is to knock people out of their position where they see the world so black and white and good and bad because when we do that we really stop listening and we stop feeling and, we, and our our compassion is drained from us uh, well thank you for making the time i honestly cannot say like uh how excited i am to talk to you and how excited i am to talk about this project because uh the good lord bird was just so exquisite um first things first i i just wanted to ask i know you've talked a little bit about this before but the line that kind of bookends the series and gets dropped in throughout is, is kind of John's line where he says, what a beautiful country. And he always says it in these moments where, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a moment where a lot of people would have the same thought. And um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that line and what the importance was to the series, like what that, um, what that meant to audiences or what you hoped audiences could take away from hearing that in, in the situations that John was in when he said it. It's a real John Brown quote. He apparently, you know, was often quoted as saying that. What a beautiful country. I found it kind of hypnotizing that he would say that uh, a person who with so much righteous anger would talk about how beautiful the country was. And I often found myself ruminating on, did he mean the, the land? Did he mean the earth that we're walking on? Or, or did he mean the concept of a government for the people, of the people, by the people. Um, you know, what did it mean that he would say that? And I read somewhere on some dubious article that that was his final words. And then I looked it up and it's, there's no basis for truth in that. Um, but then I thought, well, what if it was, you, you, you know? Well, I mean, we don't know what was going through a person's head as, as the hangman's rope goes around it, right? And so to me, it represents what we're fighting for, you know, and, and, and that whether we're talking about the earth and we're talking, are we talking about the Blue Ridge Mountains? Are we talking about the Redwoods? Are we talking about the deserts, you know, or, or are we talking about the ideal of democracy? Um, that regardless, it's worth fighting for. To pitch the fight, not in anger, but to pitch it in love. You know, that's, as a person who spent a couple of years of their life reading a lot about John Brown and reading his letters and reading what other people said about him and, and things, you feel someone fighting, fighting hard and violently, but with love. America is rife with hypocrites. Especially the North. Greed and slavery has made a trembling coward of the white man. He is so rich and fat and indolent. He cannot even remember the values upon which his country was founded. That's somehow the Zen cone of John Brown, that it kind of breaks your brain uh, you know, as, as a genuine peacenik myself, kind of really look at, at, at when too much is where you, you know, I've come so far, I'm not taking any more, you know, when, right. when you, when you pitch your tent and fight, I don't know, I found that line very moving and we just kind of came up together. It was really, it was kind of Darnell Martin's idea. Uh, and it really haunted me, this, this image of, of that being his final words and what a beautiful way it would be to bookend the whole show. Just to, yeah. to frame to frame the show and this is what we're fighting for. One of the things that really struck me about John Brown was it was a rare time where you got to see somebody being like extremely active rather than, you know, the, the images I feel like we're more familiar with seeing these days where there's a right wing radical who's got the inflamed rhetoric and who's running around, you know, yelling things and, and saying it's God's will and all this other stuff. We got to see somebody kind of in an active stance from, uh, you know, an equal rights standpoint, somebody who's fighting for something that's purely good. And I wondered how much of that aspect of it was important to you in both the portrayal and the show, like how much it was to see somebody you know, take a more active stance whose beliefs are rooted in a, in a place of pure good and, and truth in their belief. Yeah, there's something about, oh, for lack of a better word, the kind of quintessential 
liberal point of view, the hippie point of view, the we all should just love each other point of view that often gets bullied and pushed around or made to feel small or made to feel weak or made to feel, and, and it's the decisive people of the world who make history, you know, the strident people. And for some, some weird turn of nature, John Brown appears who is talking about the unwavering equality of mankind, but will not back down from a fight about it. And that's what makes it, it reminds me a little bit, you know, when I was a kid, there were these kind of left-wing heroes, you know, Johnny Cash or Christopherson, these, these white American males who were willing to pitch a fight about, uh, about equality and what democracy means and who weren't willing to let the symbol of the flag simply stand for nationalism and simply stand for white people, you know, to to have the have it represent something bigger than that, and 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 more inclusive than that. And slowly, in the course of my lifetime, you kind of saw that kind of southern. That was my grandfather. You kind of saw that southern white American male voice get drowned out by a a different voice. When I read the book, when I read McBride's book. It knocked me on my ass about, we all have these kind of knee jerk points of view where we think we understand something. And John Brown is just, he's unquantifiable. You, you know, he was as angry at the North as he was at the South. A little bit along the same lines, you know, you, you hear Martin Luther King say, I prefer the racist than silence of complicity right. um, because the, the racist I can fight and I can argue and I can talk to and I can change their point of view. But if you don't speak, if you just silently go along with systemic racism, I can't even, I, 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 there's no way to work with that. And so John Brown, he's so, I mean, on one level, he's a peacenik. On the other level, he's carrying, you know, 14 pistols. My name is Osawatomi John Brown, captain of the Potawatomi Rifles. And I am here with the Lord's blessing to free every colored person in this territory. And any man that stands against me will eat lead, grape, and powder. And on one level, he's waging war at the South, but he's really angry at the North. So he kind of defies, he, he, he doesn't fit with any knee-jerk group. Yeah, he, he feels like an activating force for everyone. He feels like the exa exactly like the show, you know, paints it to be as history paints it to be. Like he's he's the stimulation that that we needed to you know to come to terms with with that reckoning. And I, I wanted to ask too. I mean, I read in another interview that you'd done so much work to get this project off the ground, and when it came time to you know you know get in front of the camera, uh, you realized you know you had to take a little bit of a step back from the producing side of it. So you could focus on you know what it would mean to play John Brown and what went into that. From a guy who's who's an actor, who's a writer, who's who's all these things, do, does spending that much time with the whole story ahead of time, like before you dig into the performance, does that help you when you get in front of the camera, or are they completely separate things? Like, did did working on these scripts and talking through all these ideas, did that help you when you got to it, actually be John? It helps me a lot because one of the mysterious elements of this show was it, it it's striking. We were trying to strike a very similar note that the novel did, which is a note I haven't heard a lot before, which is this kind of comic note in regards to such serious subject matter. Um, that's what, what, what pitches the novel in such a unique way is like, wait, am, am I allowed to laugh at this? <laughs> And it, you know, it's like it's like John Brown being told to you by Red Fox or Chris Rock or you know Richard Pryor or something. And so I became deeply immersed in the tone of the show, and it really helped me as a performer be able when you come to set to activate the set where both humor and emotion are allowed to be at a very high level. I mean, it's like walking right up to the line of farce, you know? But if you go too far in the comic one, then the emotion goes out. If you go too far in the emotional, it can become kind of preachy or do-goodery, you know, or feel like it has an agenda with the audience. There's something beautiful about McBride's writing where he seems to be both in love with John Brown and making fun of him constantly. The old man was a plain terror in the praying department. 
They were always long-winded and could easily last an hour. Ask a blessing on my boys, Salmon and Jason, with their nocturnal struggles. I know Jason's sap of manhood is rising. Oh, Lord, be with my wife tonight. Be with all our wives. And Just when he seemed to wrap up one thought... It's hard not to think of Jonah inside the whale. Another come tumbling out and crashed up against the first. Forgive the writers of the Constitution. Ha! The testing the good Lord's patience is a sin. No, even he's got other prayers to hear. The way I looked at it is I'm not really playing John Brown. I'm playing John Brown the way Onion remembers him. For the first half of the series, you know, I'm just shouting at him because that's how I felt as a kid. Anytime I met somebody religious or with powerful convictions, older people in my life, it always felt like they were yelling at me, you, you know? And, and so I thought, well, I bet that's how Onion feels. My name is Captain John Brown, and I am here in the name of the great Redeemer, the King of Kings, the man of the Holy Trinity, and I hereby order you to get, get in his holy name, get, for he is on the side of justice, and you are on the side of chains. That balance is just something that it's really hard for me to wrap my head around, both from your performance standpoint and from the show's standpoint, just how well it walked that tightrope. There's a line that I saw you mention a few times when you're talking about your acting, where you mentioned that you you often look at acting as becoming your character's lawyer. Um, and I found that to be such an interesting kind of pivot from the idea of talking about acting as like, well, listen, I'm, I'm becoming this person, so I have to see things from their perspective and I have to just, you know, believe what they believe and, and slide into that. Um, so how did that, how did the mindset develop? Like how did the idea of looking at it from that standpoint first come about, I guess, like from, I want to be the character's lawyer? The first time I really started thinking that way was playing Chet Baker. You know, often when you see people use drugs in a movie, it's accompanied by dark music as if they're descending the well of Satan and sin and that they're doing it deliberately. Whereas listening to Chet Baker's interviews and getting intimate with him, I started realizing that this guy looked at drugs as his medicine. I mean, he heard holy music. When you start thinking of it as pain relief and you really, then you can start to understand the, the mind of the addict better which is how confusing that situation is. You're not wrong to want pain relief. That's a very legitimate thing to want is relief from your agony. Now, yeah. whether or not that's good for you really, or whether it's good for your family or whether it's good for your longevity, obviously, you know, I think Chet would have preferred not to die. That's where I started thinking about his, him as a lawyer. Like, well, what if you deleted the part of your brain that was so judgmental and you just saw it with a tremendous amount of compassion the way that you might if you love somebody, you know, like if you love an addict, you want, you don't, you understand what they're going through. You just want them to take better care of themselves. Right. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, but you don't, you don't, you don't think, Oh, I hate you or you're a bad person or you're Satan, you know, which is what often movies do to people. You know, we live in this very binary, this world where, 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 where things people think super dualistically, it's either this or it's that. And so John Brown or Chet Baker, they just slide. They don't, they're much, they live in a more circular universe where things are shades of gray. I find that deeply human, you know, I, I, I find, and I, I think that part of the job of the artistic community is to knock people out of their position where they see the world so black and white and good and bad because when we do that we really stop listening and we stop feeling and our our compassion is drained from us it's so interesting that you that that was the example you chose because when i was thinking about this when i was trying to put myself in your shoes i was thinking well i can see myself like taking that position if i was playing somebody like john brown where like his directive and his motivation is so clearly outlined like he has such a, a strong definition of of you know what his cause is and what he's fighting for and even if you know you're playing jesse in the before trilogy it's like okay like you're this person you get to step into that position you see the relationship from his side and you know you know what he's going through but you know with with other characters who are more complicated who 
uh, you know, like your, like Reverend Toller and First Reformed, yeah, really. you know, he's in crisis throughout the whole movie. And it was just very hard for me to think of like, how would the, how would a lawyer or coming at it from the character's lawyer perspective help with somebody who, you know, was so immensely complicated, like who just really didn't have a guiding ethos and was looking for that instead of having it. So. Yeah, well, sometimes you lose your, your rudder, you know, in life, you know, sometimes, you know, you know, the, in First Reformed, that's a character who's, the ballast of his ship is just knocked sideways. He doesn't know what direction he's facing. You know, it's like that John Lennon song, you know, how, how can I go forward when I don't know which way I'm facing? It, it's like, that's how I felt, Toller felt. It's like, wait, which way am I facing? Well, God forgive us for what we're doing to his creation. That's what Mansana asked me when I visited him. There's, there's been a lot of loose talk about environmental change. There's scientific consensus, 97%. The man who says nothing always seems more intelligent. Why couldn't I just keep silent? Or even Jesse, you know, you bring up, in a way, Jesse's supernaturalistic. It's it, it's not a heightened, one of the things that's beautiful about Linkletter is he never feels the desire to hyperbolize life. Mm. Ordinary daily life is hard enough just being a regular person. But I remember there was a day on set where we had scripted a moment at the top of Before Midnight where we find Jesse and Celine, you know, 10 years into their marriage, or whatever. And, and you see Jesse check out another girl. You know, there's a young woman walks by and Jesse looks at her. And the camera operator looked at me after the take and he was so upset, you know, he said, Jesse wouldn't do that, you know? And I said, what makes you say that? Cause he just, cause he loves Celine. And I'm like, so it's impossible for him to love Celine and and notice a beautiful young woman. Those, those two, those, those what that, that can't be one person to you, you know. And he's like, I guess it can be. I remember he's saying to me, it's just, it's, it's like watching a sequel to the Titanic and watching Jack check out another girl in front of Rose. Like, you, I can't, I can't have it. You fucked that little Emily Bronte girl. Look, I, I don't know what, em what, what Emily, what are you even talking about? The one that wrote the nice emails about Dostoevsky. Oh, Jesse, you're so right. The Grand Commander is the deepest message of all of Russian literature. If uh. you're asking me if I'm committed to you, the girls and the life we built together, the answer is a resounding yes. And I, I seen him and said, well, that's, this is the mission of Before Midnight is to humanize romantic love. And our goal on that movie was, could you make a romantic movie about a couple who's been together for 10 years and not tell one lie, to not goose the truth at all? And I said to this cameraman, I, I'll tell you what, Jesse's still a man and that woman is still beautiful and he's gonna notice her. And the guy was just devastated. <laughs> but it was another place where I felt like, well, I'm Jesse's lawyer here. And guess what? Jesse's not dead. He's a human being. And that woman is beautiful. And I'm sorry that that truth is so hard to, to put in our computer, you know, that a person can be multidimensional. That's, that's what's so great about, I mean, all the roles we just talked about, honestly, in all the movies, it's that you get to challenge people in terms of the idea of what somebody is to somebody in a movie becomes so concrete, especially, you know, a trilogy like that, that spans years. It's like, I need them to be this thing. I need them to be my inspiration or my perfection or my hero figure and, you know, breaking them down so that we recognize ourselves even more in them. Uh, I think makes it more realistic and makes it more challenging. And that absolutely applies to John Brown and the Good Lord Bird. So that's a great way to put it. And I've kept you too long. So thank you for making the time. Yeah, um, it's, it's easy. It's I appreciate you having me and I love talking to you. I love talking about the Good Lord Bird. Me too, sir. Thank you for making it. And uh, again, thanks for making the time. All right. Appreciate you. Take See care. You